We are joined this evening by Jeff Manson, who is running for state representative position number one. Jeff, please go ahead with your two minute introduction. Great, well, good evening, everybody. I am Jeff Manson. I am a state administrative law judge, labor leader, community disability community advocate, and former chair of this organization. And as an administrative law judge, I see every day how underfunded government affects people, including the most vulnerable individuals in our state. Uh, so I'm running for state representative to fully fund the services and, and infrastructure that we need utilizing progressive revenue sources. I've been fighting for progressive values since the fourth grade when I co-founded my elementary school's Earth Club after reading a book for kids on the environment. And since then, I've developed a track record of affecting progressive change in my community. When as a young attorney, I saw people with disabilities struggle with our legal system, I gathered disability and legal experts, and we wrote a guide for judges on how to accommodate people with disabilities in legal proceedings. When I saw the negative effects of corporate and wealthy donations on our democracy, I became a leader within the group that brought the Democracy Voucher Program to Seattle elections, a decade long effort that was finally successful in 2015. And when salaries in my own profession were stagnating and I saw we did not have a voice in our workplace, I organized administrative law judges to successfully lobby the legislature to extend collective bargaining rights to us. Then we formed our union, bargained our first contract, including a salary increase, and began to speak with a collective voice to management. And last year, they unanimously elected me as president of Wolfsey Local 562. So when I see a problem, I get out of my chair and I work with others to fix it. So now I'm running for the state house to fix bigger problems, including housing affordability, supporting working families, environmental and climate justice, and keeping our communities safe. So I'm ready to tackle these problems head on and with your help, we can do it. Thank you. We'll go ahead now to our two minute answer with prepared questions. And Laura, do you wanna take the first question? Sure thing. What tax reforms do you think are realistic in the next legislative session and what would be your strategy for implementing them? What do you feel is the ideal tax structure for Washington state in the long term? Great question, because we know this is at the root of, of most of, of our government and how it functions. So first of all, we need to, this year before the next session, defend the uh, capital gains excise tax at the in the courts and also potentially uh, at the ballot box. I support the capital gains tax and hope it uh, continues. Uh, then uh, beyond that, you know, I'm running to represent uh, or for the same seat that Representative Noel Frame currently holds, and she's been a real leader on progressive tax reform, uh, serving on the, the tax fairness work group, uh, and I imagine she'll be continuing that work in the Senate. So we'll be following her lead and the, the lead of that work group on sort of building the case for progressive taxes. Uh, this coming session and in the future. In terms of an ideal tax structure, uh, we need more progressive revenue sources and fewer or lower regressive revenue sources. So I think that includes you know, the capital gains tax, as I mentioned, which will hopefully will remain in effect, uh, which could be uh, expanded. Um, I think it includes a high earners income tax, potentially a wealth tax. And uh, there are a lot of other more progressive uh, taxes that we could implement. Uh, I think um, once we have enough progressive revenue, we could also see opportunities to lower the tax burden on the more regressive taxes. So this would be the sales tax, uh, the property tax. Uh, the B&O tax really hurts a lot of small businesses unless they have their own individual tax break. Uh, now I would want, I do believe that government generally is underfunded at present. So I wouldn't want just a one for one replacement. I do think we need more revenue, but I think with enough new progressive revenue, we could see opportunities to lower the tax burden of the more regressive sources. Thank you. Barbara, will you take the next question, please? Yes. So, Jeff, given falling enrollment over the past two years, our school districts are facing new, even more funding crisis on top of the bare minimum funding levels in place before the pandemic. What will you do and how, will you, how do you think about new measures to ensure that our schools you know, finally become uh, something close to or near fully funded? 
Yeah, absolutely. Great question. And I think you know, part of the answer is the answer to my previous question, which is how we get more revenue. But, you know, our Supreme Court, our state Supreme Court ruled a few years ago, and I had mixed feelings about the ruling, but they ruled that we had finally met our constitutional burden, our constitutional requirement to fully fund education. Now, that's a constitutional minimum, and I don't think we should pat ourselves on the back for meeting just a bare constitutional minimum. Uh, so I do believe that our public schools are uh, like a lot of government, uh, deeply underfunded. And many school districts have to rely on levies in order to supplement what they get from the state and, and other sources, which results in a lot of real inequities because uh, some school districts uh, can't raise as much revenue through property taxes. And in a lot of school districts, their levies fail at the ballot or they don't run them because they know they'll fail. You know, we tend to vote for levies here, but some parts of the states uh, other parts of the state, they don't. So there are inequitable results. So I think the state government needs to really take on this responsibility to provide the funding for public schools. And that requires additional, additional revenue. There was additional uh, money provided this last session, which is great for uh, nurses, counselors, social workers uh, in schools. That was, uh, and also a, a COLA for teachers. Great step in the right direction, still just uh, a drop in the bucket of where we need to be. Thank you. Sherry, will you go ahead and take the next question? Thank you. How have you worked to reduce climate change and specifically um, how will you uh, take ambitious steps to address the largest drivers of climate change, greenhouse gas emissions? Yeah, well, as I mentioned earlier, I started this work in fourth grade. So it's been an issue that's been close to me for a very long time. Uh, I adopted a mostly vegetarian diet right out of high school for climate change reasons. Um, you know, my transportation choices have been driven uh, by this. It's, it's really scary. I remember as a kid after reading the book, um, you know, for kids about the environment telling my parents like, oh, this is going to affect me, you know, when I'm older. Um, and now here I am older and it's absolutely affecting us. I mean, we see it in the smoke uh, during the summer. We see the glaciers on the mountains receding and they're smaller each year. I have a family member who was uh, living in a tropical area who was is basically a climate refugee because of an um, uh, increase in hurricanes. So it's really important to me, and I know we all understand the scientific reasons for it. I think the steps we need to take this next session is to uh, start off where we left off this past session. Uh, we had um, a bill to include climate impacts and comprehensive plans into the Gross Management Act that didn't pass. I think we should revisit that. Electric vehicle subsidies didn't pass. I think we need to look at that. And, and I would also say, uh, including electric bikes. Uh, and um, there's some steps we can take to move towards electrification of homes and businesses uh, that uh, didn't pass this last session. We can look at that again. Uh, but Washington State has really been a leader on climate, but we need to continue pushing the envelope so that we can demonstrate to other states and other countries that we can go down this path and that it not only doesn't break our economy, but actually makes our economy more resilient. Thank you. David, will you take our fourth question, please? Thank you. Oh, I thought I was muted. I'd be delighted. Um, in addition to the climate crisis, King County has been in a homelessness, homelessness state of emergency since 2015, and our entire state is facing a housing crisis. Do you agree that we need to add additional housing? And what will you do to ensure that all cities in our region are building the housing we need? Yes, I do agree. And um, you know, it's amazing that the state of emergency was, was announced in 2015 and the problem has only gotten worse. It's a humanitarian crisis. It's a, uh, it's, it's a clear manifestation of a failure of, of government and a failure of society, frankly. Uh, so we, do, we need to do a lot. Uh, first, for those who are unhoused in the, in the immediate term, uh, we need funding for more shelters, tiny homes, supportive housing, um, subsidized 
permanent housing. Supportive housing really is kind of the gold standard. It's expensive, but it's a lot cheaper than a hospital bed uh, or a jail cell. Uh, we did get funding this last session for about 2,000 additional supportive housing units across the state. I don't think that's going to be enough, so we may need a round two or a round three. Uh, but we need to continue to support sort of immediate housing options for those who are unhoused. In terms of the overall housing market, we are tens of thousands of units in the region behind where we need to be. People keep moving into town uh, to take jobs and because they love to live here, just like we all love to live here, uh, but we are not keeping up with the housing stock. So I do think, um, you know, Seattle has taken some steps in recent years to increase density with ADUs and in urban villages, but a lot of other cities in the region haven't. And I think, you know, our housing market doesn't stop at the city limits. So I do think it's an appropriate area for the state to step in uh, in order to increase our housing stock. Thank you. We're now gonna open it up to the executive board for questions and these are one minute responses. Pat, go ahead. Hi, um, hiding from the dog now. <laughs> uh, hi, Jeff. Um, would you support um, uh, elimination of single family zoning? So for example, making uh, like duplexes or triplexes the default uh, zoning instead of having detached single family homes be the um, default. So, uh, so something along the lines of like what Representative Bateman's bill was this last legislative session. Yeah, I support the concept behind uh, Representative Bateman's bill. Her, you know, the, the version in the House and the Senate were different and there was a big amendment to one of them. So it's hard to say exactly which details sure. we're going to yeah, see sure. uh, come, come next session. But I do think we need to add uh, additional middle housing in addition to just, um, you know, the, um, in the urban villages. Uh, whether we completely eliminate single family zoning, I don't know if if our goal is to increase the housing stock as much as possible, I don't know if that framing is uh, the best political strategy going into the next session, but I think we need to keep all options on the table and everything should be part of the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Shap, you have the next question. Thank you. Um, what will you do or what are your thoughts about how to increase housing affordability? Well, I think increasing the housing stock is a, is a major part of it. I mean, I think we have a, it's, it's not just supply and demand, but supply and demand is the main issue. We have more people moving here and staying here than we're building new housing units. So I think as we bring more housing online, that will relieve some of the pressure. I mean, we have people moving here to um, many of them to take six figure jobs for Amazon or other tech industries, which, which is great, but they're able to price a lot of us who already live here out of our existing homes. So we price people out of the next year down who price out the people the next year down who, you know, at the end of that, someone's priced either out of the city or onto the street. So I think it's a supply and demand issue. And I also think we need to just build more traditional government subsidized housing. I think the free market has um, a part to play in this in terms of supply and demand, but uh, wherever we need to get the funding, whether it's federal government, state, or local, we need more public housing and public subsidized housing. Thank you. Clayton. Um, hi, Jeff. Um, would you be willing to use eminent domain as a uh, as a short-term strategy to help homeless people. Eminent domain to acquire, say, motels so that people could have some form of housing right away. Uh, yes, you know, the devil will be in the details in terms of what parcel and what spot. And a lot of that is made at the local level. But I, I do believe that eminent domain is a tool in our tool belt and we should be using all of our tools to help uh, the housing affordability crisis. Thanks. Thank you, David. Um, <clears throat> so uh, um, I always say that uh, <clears throat> I want to ask the, uh, I always want to dispel the myth that Washington State does not have an income tax uh, because I pay B&O taxes. But, but the question uh, um, 
that I think I want to ask today is the infrastructure question. Uh, um, our state, our city, our region, uh, we have crumbling roads and bridges. Uh, we already pay uh, what I believe is the second highest gas tax in the country. That's supposed to pay for roads and bridges and maintenance. Um, <clears throat> how would you, as a legislator, um, ad address this issue? The yeah, I mean, yeah, this is a nationwide problem, but it's we see it front and center right here in the 36, especially with two of our bridges, including the Magnolia Bridge and the Ballard Bridge that are at risk of failing. Um, we did pass a transportation package this last uh, session, which is great, um, but we don't need to wait another 10 years for the next one. And this last one did not include an increase in the gas tax, which is usually what accompanies and funds a lot of these uh, transportation packages. Are we going to have another one this coming session? Maybe not, but I, I think within the next few years we can look at doing another one because we can't wait. We have, I mean, besides just basic maintenance, uh, you know, potholes and, you know, driving down our roads, but we also may need to provide extra support to, uh, to sound transit so we can get light rail through the district as soon as we can. So I would, I would support looking for every resource we can to uh, fund infrastructure. Thank you, Barbara. You have the next question. Thank you, uh, Jeff. I am going to ask you a sort of a distaff question about building housing. So I'm, I practice landscape architecture in uh, King County and Seattle and Western Washington for 40 years. And uh, I had a lot to do with um, getting all the critical areas mapped, getting all the chains of parks mapped, getting all the view sheds protected, getting all of the, get, helping get the laws on the books about runoff. And I am personally really frightened that these, the blanket proposals for, you know, proposals for blanket upzoning will um, ignore all that and take that work apart. And it's all across the state. Um, the measures that were put in place in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and aughts um, for uh, nuanced protection of the environment, which is not zoning. Um, so you did, met, you, I'm sorry, I'm taking so long, but you did mention that we need to go back to work on the um, growth management plan, but that is actually um, just the beginning. What I'm, what I'm asking you is, how do you bird dog legislation as it comes up and against this vociferous need for housing to protect those things um, in every bill and in every proposal? Yeah, and I think you you get to kind of the heart of the um, you know devil <clears throat> is always in the details, right? And yes. this is a complicated issue. And I think this is why Representative Bateman's bill didn't pass this last session. I mean, it was a short session, but it's really hard to tackle something this involved in a short session. Right. Um, and, we, but we, and we also need to strike the right balance. I mean, I think leaving everything to the cities hasn't worked. I think we can, we can acknowledge that. You know, some cities have taken steps, others haven't. But you also don't want the state coming in uh, with a hammer where you should have a scalpel or you know, prescribe rigid requirements that may work in some communities and may work in not. But if you give too much flexibility, then we're not going to get the housing we need. So I think it's going to be a tough issue to figure out, and I'm ready to get to work to do it. Uh, and getting, getting that balance where, and whether it's setting housing goals, and then you sue cities if they don't get enough housing. I mean, I don't know how we could do this, but we need to be creative about how we set requirements that are flexible enough for the reasons you mentioned. All right, Jeremy. That, sorry, that's all the time we have for questions. That's all the time we have. Thank you so much, Laura. I'm sorry, Jeremy. Uh, Jeff, will you go ahead with your one minute closing statement? Thank you so much. Absolutely. Well, it is uh, an absolute honor to be on the interviewing end of this after having done 26 rounds of this on the other side. Thank you all for the work that you're doing. I cannot say just how much of an honor and how much of a thrill it would be to receive the endorsement of the 36th District Democrats. I've given um, 
you know, my last 15 years of my life to this organization and to the causes that we all believe in and would just be absolutely honored uh, to have the support of the organization and your individual support. And uh, Jeremy, happy to chat afterwards. Uh, would love to answer your question offline. Thank you so much, Jeff.